Tonight, Quebec ERs once again understaffed and overwhelmed. The hallways are completely full with people waiting. Patients frustrated, healthcare workers exhausted. What's driving the holiday surge? A very green holiday break. I think right now there's just a lot of disappointment. Warm temperatures put the brakes on winter fun. A man survives six days trapped in his crushed truck. One more day and something would have been very different. The incredible story of how he was finally rescued. This is The National with Renee Filipponi. Thanks for joining us. Adrian is away. Respiratory viruses are on the move right now, right across the country. And so are Canadians as they gather in groups for the holidays. It could all add more pressure to healthcare systems that are already struggling. Quebec's emergency rooms are operating way past capacity right now, with visits surging again today after a brief pre-Christmas lull. And doctors warn harder days are on the horizon. Circulating viruses are one part of the picture, but as Quibina Adoro shows us, staffing and overall capacity issues also play a part. Caroline Cannon is taking a breather outside after being in the packed ER all morning with her husband. The department at Montreal's Jewish General Hospital is at over 200% capacity. So we got triage within about 20 minutes. It wasn't too bad. There was no one in the hallways. We were sitting and now the hallways are completely full with people waiting. Cannon has worked in Quebec hospitals for 18 years and says she's not surprised. It's not the fault of the doctors or the nurses. It's just we are so short in staff. Um, I used to do schedules and I can tell you a lot of staff missing and everyone's doing everything to get more staff in. Quebec hospitals have been under strain most of December. The situation approved a bit around the holidays. But by midday Wednesday, Montreal emergency rooms were at, on average, 130% capacity. In the Laurentians, north of Montreal, it was 149%. And it goes back up for between Christmas and New Year's. Then it'll go back a little bit for New Year's. And then after, you know, January 2nd, 3rd, 4th, is like one of the worst stretch of the year. Part of the issue, flu, COVID, and RSV. Just last week, the province said one million Quebecers were dealing with respiratory viruses. And even if the majority of them have mild cases that don't require hospital care, even a small fraction of that showing up to the emergency room is going to overwhelm the healthcare system. The holiday season also plays a part, limiting options for people who need care. Other resources that people could have used, like walk-in clinics, like non-urgent care, they tend to sometimes not operate during the holiday season, and so that shunts more people to the emergency rooms. So, Quabina, what is the province doing? So, Renee, the province is urging people to use other resources like calling 811 where they can speak to a nurse or visiting a pharmacist. Now, it's also trying to free up 1,000 beds to allow patients to be transferred out of the ERs. But one ER doctor I spoke to says that there's nowhere to put these patients, so transferring people out of the ERs is like nearly impossible. Thanks, Quabina. Healthcare staff are just some of the public sector workers in Quebec who have been holding rolling strikes since November. But today, a milestone in negotiations. The province has now reached tentative agreements specifically on working conditions with all of the unions known as the Common Front. Together, they represent about 420,000 workers. But the agreements so far do not cover salaries or benefits. So the threat of a full strike in the new year remains. British Columbia is bracing for extreme weather with warnings issued along the coast. From Haida Gwaii to the tip of Vancouver Island, people can expect strong winds into tomorrow night, up to 110 kilometers per hour in some areas. High tides and large waves could lead to flooding. That weather is not what many were hoping for this week. Across the country, Canadians are experiencing an unseasonably warm winter. And as Yvette Bren shows us, that's frustrating for those who love snow sports and the businesses that rely on them. The holiday break is usually a great time to hit the slopes, but not enough snow to bother for these skiers. It used to be all beautiful with the snows and everything. Right now, no, no it's just a uh, gravel. So we just decided not to. Snowboard sales here are slow despite discounts. I think right now there's just a lot of disappointment. We were a little impatient and now it's time and we don't really get to get out there, so it's a bummer. The El Nino weather pattern has warmed the West Coast. We expected a lot more snow. We expected 
that to be frozen over to get the skates out. <laughs> but it's still, it's still beautiful. But other parts of Canada are also unseasonably warm, making it difficult for businesses banking on winter weather. December is always a challenge uh, with Mother Nature for us, but uh, it, it seems to be getting harder and harder. And, and this year, especially, uh, especially, has been difficult. In Alberta last Friday, 10 temperature records were broken. At least two were 50 years old, according to Environment and Climate Change Canada. Some parts got close to 15 degrees Celsius. Well, absolutely. It's very unlike uh, this time of the year when in Canada. I mean, we are the snowiest country in the world. We're the second coldest, and, and this is more like a Vancouver Christmas from coast to coast. Uh, it is absolutely, in many ways, shocking because it is national. So with slopes like this, a lot of people are checking the weather daily for any sign of new snow. I bought a, f a five day pass to Whistler and I haven't used it yet. So, and a lot of people have done that. So I feel sorry for them, I really do. And I feel sorry for the, the, all the resorts and everything because you know, they're trying to make some money, right? And it's hard to make money when you don't have any snow. For now, all skiers can do is hope. Yvette Bren, CBC News, Vancouver. In Winnipeg, four teenagers are facing manslaughter charges after a shocking crime spree that left a 27-year-old man dead. Police say the victim was attacked on the sidewalk at around 2 in the morning by a group of boys between 14 and 16 years old. They say the teens beat him with a rifle and stabbed him. Police say the group also robbed and assaulted three teenagers and then attacked a driver while trying to steal his car. Police are still searching for two more suspects, aged 14 and 15. The New York Times is launching a legal battle over artificial intelligence. The lawsuit accuses OpenAI and Microsoft of using articles published by the Times without permission. This case is part of a bigger push to make tech companies pay for content used to train chatbots, including ChatGPT. And as Anise Hadari explains, this fight could have big implications for the future of AI. Millions of news articles claimed to cause billions of dollars in damages. The New York Times, the first major American media company to sue tech giant Microsoft and the company it funds, OpenAI, creator of ChatGPT. The Times claims the company's trained artificial intelligence by using its news articles without paying for them. This is a get out the popcorn moment. It's just the start. In terms of Analysts say media wants a share of tech revenue. AI is data driven. It's content creator driven. It's the biggest tech transformation since the start of the internet. And the content providers, they don't want to be on the outside looking in. And that's why this is an important case going in 2024. In a statement to CBC News, OpenAI said, we are surprised and disappointed with this development. We're hopeful that we will find a mutually beneficial way to work together. In the past, so the company promised right to protect clients from lawsuits. We will step in and defend our customers and pay the costs incurred if you face legal claims around copyright infringement. Though OpenAI itself is seeing other lawsuits from high-profile Hollywood stars and authors over copyright, and experts say AI couldn't make anything on its own. And I think we really need to understand how much uh, this is a kind of reanimation of many, many thousands of humans' own creativity that's trying to be captured by, by OpenAI and then sold for a profit. This is an American lawsuit with nothing filed in Canada, but the federal government has been consulting on what copyright law looks like for AI, with a report expected sometime in 2024. Anise Hidari, CBC News, Edmonton. Michigan's Supreme Court has decided Donald Trump can stay on the ballot in the upcoming Republican primary. It refused to hear a bid to disqualify Trump from seeking the nomination in Michigan, a stark contrast to Colorado. Its top court ruled last week that Trump should be barred from running because his support of the 2021 attack on the Capitol amounted to insurrection. Similar challenges have been made in dozens of states. It's expected that the U.S. Supreme Court will make the final ruling on Trump's eligibility. There is an incredible story coming out of Indiana tonight. A 27-year-old man finally rescued after spending six days trapped in his truck after it crashed off an interstate. One more day and something could have been very different here. The truck had rolled down an embankment towards a creek and then under a bridge out of sight of anyone passing above. 
Thankfully, these two were at ground level scouting for fishing spots Tuesday when they spotted the mangled wreck and a body inside. They thought the man was dead. He had a jacket almost like mine and uh, and all I seen was this part, the shoulder, and I went to touch the shoulder and the moment I touched the shoulder, he swung around. He woke up. He says uh, he tried yelling and screaming, but nobody would hear him. He was pinned in and his phone was out of reach. Police say he survived on rainwater. It took hours for emergency workers to cut him out of the truck. He remains in critical condition. American officials were in Mexico today with urgent requests for action to stem the tide of migrants making their way to the U.S. border. As they keep crossing in huge numbers, Tanya Fletcher shows us how it's pushing Democrats to turn on their presidents. There are still days from the U.S. border, but they're already putting pressure on the Biden administration. This caravan started on Christmas Eve near Mexico's southern border with Guatemala and has since grown to nearly 10,000 people, the largest caravan in more than a year. Migrants from Honduras, El Salvador, Venezuela, Haiti. El presidente está unido. The president of the United States must help us, says this man. The Biden administration sent a delegation to meet with top Mexican officials, reportedly wielding a wish list of measures for Mexico. They include moving migrants further south to decongest the border, exerting more control over railways between the two countries, and using incentives like visas to convince migrants to stay in Mexico. Many border towns are overwhelmed and directly blaming the White House. And it's just a, an unfair unethical situation. We feel ignored by the federal government. Texas has taken to busing and now also flying hundreds of migrants to sanctuary cities, where Democratic mayors, despite their politics, are also demanding action. We're not getting the help that we deserve from Washington, D.C. But we are hitting real challenges, and these are the ones we've been pushing the federal government on, which is we need more resources. Without significant federal support, um, this is not sustainable. Getting a handle on the border problem was something Joe Biden campaigned on. For decades, immigration reform has been a bipartisan in this country. Now it's a potential weak spot Republicans hope to exploit. This is going to have impact on the 2024 election. Um, the, the reason this is vexing is because Republicans and Democrats would rather use this, this, this issue as a political bludgeon to knock each other over the head rather than to solve the problem. Tanya, the border has become a roadblock in Congress. Yeah, that's right, Renee. Republicans are refusing to approve money for Israel and Ukraine without a new crackdown at the Mexican border. Lawmakers have struggled to hash out a deal that would expand deportations and curb asylum claims, among other things. Any hopes of a deal here in Washington are now on hold until the holiday break is over. And that leaves the White House taking flack from all sides and staring down a tidal wave of people, Renee. Tanya Flesher in Washington. Thank you. Turning to the Middle East now, where Israel continues to intensify its military operation inside Gaza, warning its campaign to crush Hamas could go on for months. Julia Wong shows us the latest from inside that battered territory where civilians are running out of places to escape the fighting. For this Palestinian family, life gets harder by the day. We are displaced, Amjad Hajaj says, displaced to a very primitive house. They are among the many who have fled their homes. Nearly 85 percent of people living in Gaza are displaced. As Israel escalates attacks in central Gaza, many who were sheltering in a UN-run school now frantically looking for an escape, though some say there's nowhere to go. The people of Gaza do not need aid, one man says. Our message to the entire world, implement a ceasefire. But Israel warns the war could last for months, and it says it's trying to be surgical with its operations. My information is that civilian casualties are going down, and that's a good thing. But the Hamas-run health ministry says the toll is only rising, reporting more than 21,000 people killed. The conflict has drawn the ire of Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, which governs the West Bank, in his first interview since the war started. What's happening to the Palestinian people on the ground is more than a catastrophe and more than a genocide, he says. 
Israel maintains its objective is to free the hostages in Gaza and defeat Hamas, and calls the loss of civilian life in the crossfire tragic. And with the WHO saying more than half of Gaza's hospitals are not functioning, this international team of doctors says more medical help is needed. The Gaza Strip needs include surgeons, care for trauma patients, intensive care units and surgical specialties, a spokesperson for an Islamic charity says. There are reports U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken will visit the Middle East again next week, his fourth trip since the conflict started. Washington has been pressing Israel to scale down its assault and take a more targeted approach. Julia Wong, CBC News, London. Sad news from the film world. Respected South Korean actor Lee Sun Kiyun, star of the Oscar-winning film Parasite, has been found dead after an apparent suicide. <laughs> Already a big name in South Korea, Lee Sun Kiyun drew global attention playing the wealthy patriarch in the Oscar-winning black comedy thriller Parasite, the first non-English film to win Best Picture. The 48-year-old had been reported missing after a weeks-long police investigation into suspected illegal drug use, allegations he denied, saying he was being blackmailed. South Korea has very strict anti-drug laws. The investigation triggered intense media scrutiny and online gossip about his private life. He was found dead in his car Wednesday in Seoul, reportedly with a suicide note. Lee Sun Kiyun leaves behind a wife, also a noted actor, and two children. And television pioneer Tom Smothers has died. Our government is asking us as citizens, good yeah. citizens, to refrain from traveling to foreign lands. Okay, all you guys in Vietnam, come on home. <laughs> Tom Smothers was one half of the Smothers Brothers, a comedy duo whose political satire made their 1967 variety show an instant hit, especially with young audiences. Brothers Tom and Dick made biting comments on the Vietnam War and hosted subversive bands. CBS first censored the show, then canceled it in its third season, though it was still popular. I feel if uh, television in the United States isn't opened up, be the easiest way for the country to become totalitarian by the control of the media. Their defiance of network censors earned the brothers a place in history, but they never again achieved such success or influence. Tom Smothers died at age 86 after being treated for cancer. He is survived by his brother. Some electric vehicle owners are facing a major hurdle to charge their cars. Park the car, charge it and walk home, about a 15-minute walk from here. What's stopping condos from installing more chargers? A common animal is posing a major threat in Mumbai. Where I stay, there are a lot of pigeons. How pigeons can be a danger to your health. And remembering a moment of perseverance. It's not how you fall, it's how you get back up, so that's what I did. We're back in two. As the Canadian government tries to phase out gas-powered vehicles, getting more electric cars produced is just one part of the puzzle. Drivers need somewhere to charge those cars, especially difficult for some condo dwellers. Katie Nicholson shows us how some are trying to change that. When Claude Michon needs to juice up his EV, he has to drive it to this public charging station. Park the car, charge it, and walk home, about a 15-minute walk from here and then walk back the next morning, pick the car up, uh, fully charged. There's nowhere to charge it in his condo building and the parking lot next to his place doesn't have enough power for even one charging station. Retrofitting condos and parking lots with EV chargers isn't cheap anywhere from hundreds of dollars to thousands if the transformers that feed the building need to be upgraded. The cost is dramatically lower if you do it during the build as opposed to, to a retrofit. At the University of Toronto, Olivier Trescas is part of a research team developing new EV charging technology. He says it's best that developers build for the future. A good compromise is just to have the rough-in, so that is to have the power connection from the panel to the parking spot, and then, uh, you know, when the time comes, you can actually install the charger and plug it into that receptacle. 
Across the country, there's a mishmash of incentives and regulations for new builds to include varying numbers of EV charging stations, while federally, the government's trying to change the electrical code to make new residential buildings EV ready. Some condos that are being developed right now that aren't actually putting in 100 percent. They're doing just, you know, the minimum. But at least one Toronto developer is going all in on a net zero future. We will have four levels of underground parking and every one of those spaces will have EV charges. It costs an extra 10 to 12 million dollars, but she believes it's worth it. It's a win-win for the environment. It also is, you know, entices people that purchase a unit here to buy an EV vehicle. A feature that really would have helped Claude Michon out. That would be an excellent idea, yes. And saved him all these trips back and forth. Katie Nicholson, CBC News, Toronto. As EVs cut emissions, a group of BC researchers is working on a potentially game-changing way to store them. Julia Wong shows us their plan to sequester carbon dioxide below the seafloor. The climate impacts have to be addressed. For Kate Moran, the fight to bring down emissions means conquering a new frontier, the ocean. The ocean has the biggest capacity, including the ocean basalt, to actually help us with removing CO2 from the atmosphere. The Solid Carbon Project is the first of its kind in Canada, years in the making. Wind turbines will power direct air capture technology, aiming to suck CO2 from the air, then pump it below the ocean floor, where the CO2 would react with basalt, eventually turning into rock. Carbon sequestration is already happening on land, but Moran says this is different. This technology is the ultimate in terms of durability because it will react with the, with the basalt, form rock, and never go back into the atmosphere. This past summer, the team went on an expedition to survey the ocean floor and to test camera equipment and CO2 monitoring devices. And we're looking at this Cascadia region. Its focus is on the Cascadia Basin, 300 kilometers off Vancouver Island. The team says basalt there has the potential to store 750 gigatons of CO2, or up to 20 years of global emissions. These red clusters show how much basalt there is on Earth. The big question is whether all this can be done. It's not going to capsize or something like that. Um, so it does look like a, a feasible way to do it. I think for some people that concept might just be a little mind-blowing. Yes, and it is. I mean, it is. You're, anytime you go offshore, it's a more extreme environment. Moran sees this project as necessary to help save the planet. My view is that innovation doesn't happen without perseverance. The team still needs to demonstrate that this can work, and they need $60 million in funding to get there. If successful, this Made in Canada solution could be used around the world in the fight to lower emissions. Julia Wong, CBC News, North Saanich, British Columbia. Cars stolen in Canada are making their way across the world. I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in your once stolen vehicle in West Africa. Really? Yeah, I'm in West Africa. No way. We revisit our investigation into the thefts and why it's hard to stop them. You'll see about 80% of them uh, going out through the ports. But first, pigeons are taking over Mumbai and making people sick. I find it difficult while breathing. The National breaks down the stories shaping our world next. Severe storms pummeled parts of Australia's east coast over Christmas and Boxing Day. Hail was so heavy at times it looked like snow. Powerful winds tore the roofs off buildings and toppled trees. Two women were swept away by floodwaters. At least 10 people have died. Thousands are still without power. A painful lung disorder is on the rise in Mumbai. The chronic disease is linked to the city's rising pigeon population. Public health officials are warning residents not to feed the birds. But as Salima Shivji shows us, many are reluctant to stop. A common sight in Mumbai. Pigeons at every turn, along with those feeding them. A seemingly innocuous pastime that's fueling a health emergency. Nothing good, 
This pulmonologist is seeing more patients walk through his door with hypersensitivity pneumonitis a severe inflammation of the lungs that in the worst cases requires an oxygen supply 24-7 or a transplant. So there are more than 300 reasons to get this hypersensitivity pneumonia. Pigeons is one of them, okay. Most important thing, this is the most common cause of the disease in our country. It comes from pigeon poo, which has fungi that when inhaled over a sustained period can be deadly. Mumbai's doctors have tracked a five-fold increase in cases of the disease as the city's pigeon population has exploded. And then patient points out so that this may be a possibility. Dr. Prabhu Desai says he's forced to hand out an information chart because patients often don't know that pigeons are the culprit. Because they are very stubborn birds, you can say. They, they don't go. Patients like Namrata Trivedi, who's relieved to finally be back at work after years of steroids and rehab to suppress her symptoms. When I was first diagnosed, the x-rays showed an entire black patch across my lungs. I was told I had only three years to live, she says, all because I used to feed the pigeons. I had no idea. Cases are so high here in Mumbai because it's the perfect breeding ground for pigeons dense with so many apartment buildings and a tradition of feeding the birds for religious reasons like washing away your sins, that's hard to break. That tradition irks Prakash Punjabi as he goes through the exercises that help control his chronic condition. He needs oxygen to get him through the session. It's very difficult. Normally, when you walk, so I find it difficult while breathing through nose. Punjabi suspects he got the disease when he spent so much time at home during the pandemic, but he also frequently sees others feeding the pigeons. You can't ban or anything, you can't do anything. Only you have to be very cautious. Technically, there are fines against feeding pigeons outside of designated areas, but that bylaw is rarely enforced. It's left up to doctors to plead with the people of Mumbai. Don't feed the birds. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Mumbai. Now let's break down the news shaping our world. When a car is stolen in Canada, there's a very good chance it will end up in Ghana. David Common found that out firsthand when he traveled to the African country to chase down red-hot vehicles being resold. Tonight, once again, he breaks down the workings of a vast criminal network and finds out what can be done to deter those thieves. There we go. Here's an ownership. North York, Ontario. We're in West Africa. Yep. How could I see? There's the original Quebec license plate. Every one of these vehicles ripped off and shipped down. All right. This is stolen from? Canada. From Canada? Yes ending up sold abroad in places like Ghana. And how many Canadian cars have you seized that are just in this lot? Um, for the two months, I think we've seized more than 40 cars. There are clues to the original owners, from stickers to a snow brush. Oh, even better. Canadian flag. And in one car, a phone number for the original owner, Len Green of Toronto. I'm gonna phone him. Might be too early for a phone call, or maybe looking at a number they don't recognize. Hello? Hi, is that Leonard? Yeah. Leonard, this is gonna sound like a really weird call. Um, my name is David Common. I'm calling from CBC News. We're doing an investigation into stolen vehicles. And I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in your once stolen vehicle in West Africa. Really? Yeah, I'm in West Africa. No way. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you mind if I FaceTime you? Uh, I don't mind at all. This uh, look like your car? <laughs> That's it. That's it, it was stolen um, September, October of last year. And what happened? So we were going out that day in the morning. My wife went out to get in the car and uh, it wasn't in the driveway. When we checked the camera, 
video from the camera from the ring uh, doorbell. At about three in the morning, you see a car and two guys pull up towards the driveway. And about four minutes later, the light goes off. They're gone. The car's gone from the driveway. I know this is probably not the call you expected today, but your ownership is still in the glove box. Um, here's your car. There's a car that still has a New Jersey license plate on it. There's a car stolen from North York over there. I can't believe it. And, and my documents and everything are still in there. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. Crazy indeed, but Len is hardly alone. Eastbound 47, about 190, 200. Auto theft in Canada has never been this bad. High speed chases, home invasions, violent carjackings, but rarely do the bad guys get caught. Last year, they stole 27,000 cars from the Greater Toronto and Hamilton area alone, one every 17 minutes. A large portion of them are actually leaving the country. You'll see about 80% of them uh, going out through the ports. Detective Mark Haywood of Peel Regional Police is one of Canada's foremost specialists on theft for export. Uh, much easier to sell 15 cars on the black market than it is to sell 15 keys of cocaine or 15 illegal guns. And they're seeing that profitability. Just how big? Deputy Chief Nick Milinovich. Last year in 2022, there was over a billion dollars worth of vehicles uh, that were stolen across Canada. And it's now one of the top three uh, funders of organized crime. So it's big business, big profit for them. Huge, huge. This was the spot it was stolen from? In <laughs> yes, Oakville, sir. Ontario. It was parked right here. We arrived home from Greg and Lynn Gannett became just the latest of their neighbors to be targeted. We walked outside and, and the car was not there. They just drove it away, basically. Like it was, it was amazing actually how quickly they were able to steal it. So smoothly, the thieves only barely triggered this motion capture camera. When police arrived, they told them the car's gone forever. It's probably already on its, its way to Montreal, yeah. <laughs> going to Africa or some other foreign country. Yeah. After a steal, thieves move cars quickly to shipping containers where GPS tracking is muffled, then placed on tractor trailers or rail lines to the Port of Montreal. What countries are those cars ending up in? Several. We're seeing a lot of them go to the UAE, to Dubai. There's uh, Nigeria is a hotbed for that. Ghana is another place that they're showing up in. It's scary and increasingly violent. But we've come to Greg and Lynn because of a stunning discovery. We think we found your car. Wow. We believe we found your car located in the West African nation of Ghana. Wow. Oh my goodness. Wow. <laughs> and uh, it's for sale. <laughs> oh, well, isn't that interesting? So here's the next thing. We're gonna actually try to see your car. Oh, wow. <laughs> We're gonna go to Ghana. Excellent. It is a long journey into a world full of snatched cars. This vehicle reported stolen in Ontario, was stolen from Saint Laurent, Quebec, Ottawa, Ontario in 2023. This vehicle stolen in Ontario. Cars seized by Ghana's Economic and Organized Crime Office. We are doing all that we can to ensure that at least, if not to eradicate all, we can actually bring it to the barest minimum. Alex Lindsay runs surveillance for the office. Even he admits all this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think the Canadian courts need to be more proactive in trying to stop it before even it gets down here. Okay, this is wild. We're just driving along through traffic. There's a car with a Quebec license plate on the road in front of the organized crime authorities just driving along. That car bails from traffic quite possibly a new arrival. Just take a look as we slow drive past all the used car dealers. Is it very likely these vehicles we're seeing are stolen? Yes. They, they are? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Indeed, Lexus, Honda, Dodge Rams, Toyota, some of the most stolen vehicles in Canada now here for sale openly. Even law enforcement has to be careful. They have issued threats to officers that the next time probably we come to retrieve cars, 
they are going to um, um, fight. So we have us. to be very careful driving. So we have to be very careful. Back at headquarters, we sit down with the office's deputy director. We do encounter some few resistance. Abdullah Bashiru Dabila tells us how they know which vehicles to seize based on intelligence from the FBI. So the situation we have with respect to these vehicles is such that, yes, we are collaborating with the FBI. The FBI has uh, given us evidence that the vehicles were stolen from Canada and then the United States. Dabila says he needs Canada to step up to stop the flow in the first place. It sounds to me like Canadian law enforcement, in your mind, could be doing a lot more. Yes. No Canadian agency, except, except through the FBI, has approached us directly or made a formal complaint to us directly. We've tracked Lynn and Greg's car to this lot in Ghana, and we're going looking for it. We understand that there was a vehicle that was reported stolen from Canada that ended up at this dealership, at this lot. Hey. The workers get agitated quickly. Do you sell stolen vehicles here? But the lot is full of the most stolen vehicle types in Canada. Do you mind if I look at the VIN numbers and just see? Uh... They push back and approach our camera operator. Why are you taking pictures of the place? I'm filming my journalist. No, you don't, you don't have the right to take the pictures here. Because like, if I look at this Acura, like, this is the kind of damage that happens when they put them in shipping containers when they're stolen. So do you mind if I look at the, the VIN? We've been warned this is risky, so we head out to call up Lynn and Greg. Kind of suspicious. Okay, we have been to the dealership that your car was last seen at. And guess what? It's not there anymore. Um, it appears they may have sold it. It's incredible to us that, that you are where you are at the lot where you, you know you tracked us from the car from Ontario across across the, you know the world to Ghana. Next, we go inside the fight to stop cars from being stolen. We've just retrieved one of those vehicles back from them. We've caused the disruption, and uh, that's the goal. has just come into port in Montreal, loaded with stolen cars being returned to Canada, intercepted by authorities in Malta halfway through their voyage. Our investigators, they will cut that shortly. The Range Rover by Land Rover is the first vehicle. The shopping list of the most stolen vehicles Looks like they've taken care and it's in good shape. Again, really push button start, SUV or pickup truck are really the targeted vehicles and that's the theme that we're seeing here as well. Investigator Brian Gast works with the Equite Association. It works to reduce the massive claims member insurance companies now face from ballooning auto theft. The first thing that comes to my mind, there, the crisis that's happening in Ontario and Quebec is we've just retrieved one of those vehicles back from them. We've caused the disruption and uh, that's the goal. Plus, there are clues here. Out of the shipping containers, vehicles get a more forensic examination. So we're just looking at any of the damage that they, uh, they, they made to steal the vehicle, looking to see how the, the vehicle was stolen. This was an onboard diagnostic port attack, or OBD. They remove that part to get access to the computer of the vehicle to reprogram the key. So it's a reprogramming theft. And then we have uh, relay attacks, where you have somebody at the front uh, doorbell or your front of your residence what, with what looks to be an antenna. They're trying to intercept the re radio frequency between that uh, key fob and the vehicle. Okay. So how many times has your car been stolen? Three times. Over how long? We originally okay. met Natalie Cara after the and first theft. 
here it is, a suspected relay attack in her driveway at home. The car was recovered thanks to a GPS system on board. Months later, she looked out the window at work. Here. And you're, you're watching them steal yeah. your car from that window. Yeah, correct. She told Three me, men, one getaway car, car, and Natalie confronts looking, them. I'm, I'm looking and I'm like, no! <laughs> and I'm coming out and yelling at them. I'm, I'm like, what are you guys doing? And uh, they got afraid. So one of the guy went into the car and I was face to face like you and I. Like this close. This close, even closer. <laughs> And then I said, and all hood, black jeans, hood, and then the mask. And then he said, sorry, he said, sorry, jumped in the car, and then off they went. Looking at the damage, this is the newest form of theft. Under that damaged wheel well is the CAN bus. Thieves connect to a port there and can quickly unlock and start the car. It's a weak point. Yeah. And I asked Lexus what they're doing about this, and they're working on it. We hear that from a lot of automakers. Yeah, yeah. they're working on it. Well, Natalie's story isn't over yet. She brings her car here for repairs, but her in-car GPS system then alerts her the car's on the move. And an hour later, I got the manager of Lexus calling me and saying, you know, your car got stolen overnight. But it's this car yeah. it's recovered the again. Thanks the to the GPS yeah. system, the thieves failed to deactivate. You know, the reward's very high and the risk is very low. We have anecdotal stories of people who have stolen cars, walked out of court and stolen another car in the same parking lot. So, you know, the, the risk there is not what it needs to be. How good a job do we do in Canada combating auto theft? I don't think we do a very good job. Uh, Michael Rotha represents leasing and finance companies who are urging widespread action now. In the last five years, there's been a 300% increase in auto theft in the GTA. 300%? 300%. What's going on? From our perspective, it's a lack of enforcement. He wants Canada's antiquated system of tracking exports improved, plus far more inspections of containers leaving ports. And then obviously resourcing Canada Border Services so they have more agents. In some ports they have maybe one or two people that are tasked with this and also more scanners for the containers as they go out. We've become a, a, a global donor in stolen vehicles. When you compare certain brands, there's more cars being stolen in, in Canada than there are being in the U.S. Given that they're 10 times the size, that gives you the sense of the, the, the magnitude of this issue. There is an element for industry, the auto industry, to play in the issue of auto thefts. Making like, it harder to steal. Absolutely. I think consumers really need to do their due diligence. Uh, vote with your dollars is a very, very simple concept, right? We look at safety ratings, we look at performance stats, we look at, you know, the style of vehicle. Included in that conversation should be uh, the security of that vehicle and your ability to prevent it being stolen. When David Common first brought you that story back in September, it got a lot of attention from CBC viewers, but also in several other countries where news outlets reported on what we found. That includes the media in Ghana. Next, a Canadian athlete's gold medal tumble. That's what defines me. I fall, I get back up. Our favorite moment that falls to number five. Next. We are counting down our best moments of the year. Tonight at number five, a slip and fall that deserves a gold medal. You know, it's not how you fall, it's how you get back up. The gun is pulling away, the Canadian. I mean, I was all out since like 500 till the end, so I was just like, going through every obstacle as fast as I could. Degania has got this. And the last one I had like just a little slip. Oh, that is a major incident. Degania slips. Just a little technical difficulty. This was the moment. It all went horribly awry though. Tried to step on the top of the steeple at the water jump. 
came crashing down. But I think that's what defines me. I fall, I get back up. But he recovers. He's so far ahead. He's you know, it's not how you fall, it's how you get back up. So that's what I did. What a recovery from the Canadian. Has the luxury to slip and fall and still romp his way to gold in glory for Canada. Beautifully. What an uplifting moment of perseverance and inspiration. And aside from being a talented athlete, Jean Simone is also in medical school studying immunology with the hope of being a doctor. Thank you for being with us. You can watch anywhere, anytime on the free CBC News app and subscribe to the Nationals YouTube channel. I'm Renee Filippone. Take care.